welcome to the Leather Archives and Museum. Uh, I hope uh, those of you who have not been here before had a chance to take in the galleries downstairs before the performance. And if not, or even if you did, uh, I invite you to come back because there's an entire another part of the building with a research library and more galleries and lots of good stuff. Uh, we're open every Thursday and Friday from 11 to 7, and every Saturday and Sunday from 11 to 5. Every Thursday from 3 to 7 is free day, so it's like a great day to come and, and bring your friends and check out leather history. Uh, I have this feeling that tonight's presentation is going to get you very excited and very pumped up about leather history and about archives. And if you start feeling excited about our history and all of the amazing work that our archivists are doing here, I want you to think about how all of that happened. Uh, unfortunately, the Leather Archives is not funded by government grants. There's not a whole lot of foundations beating, beating down our doors with grant money. Not a whole lot of corporations are quite to the point yet where they want to stick their logo next to a sex music. Uh, what you hear talked about tonight happened because kinky people and leather people say, this is important to me and I support it. So if you're not a member of the Leather Archives and Museum, um, I'm going to go out in the lobby after the uh, program this evening, and I would love to talk to you about membership and the way that you can do your part, do your part to make what we do here happen. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, Gene Hardy comes to us from the University of Michigan, where he's currently pursuing a master's of science in that institution's School of Information. Uh, prior to being a Wolverine, Gene received his Bachelor of Arts in English Literature and Theory at the University of Washington. He works at the U of M's Spectrum Center as an Educational Outreach Assistant Coordinator, and through his work there, he trains and coordinates speakers on LGBTQ <coughs> topics. Gene Hardy laughs loudly, sometimes <laughs> very loudly. I know this firsthand despite my office being on a complete <laughs> uh, Gene has also worked at the University of Michigan with the infamous and legendary uh, Gil Rubin. Uh, he has done a lot as an archival intern this summer, but I know that I get a little bit agitated when someone who is introducing me uh, gives away all of my content while they're introducing me. And so I will let him tell you all about what he's been doing here this summer. Uh, please join me in welcoming someone for whom I have a great deal of respect, Gene Hart. Um, so I entered my program knowing that I was required to do a summer internship. 
Um, and I never really thought twice about anywhere but the Leather Archives and Museum. Um, and it felt like the perfect place to advance my skills as, as an archivist, um, and with, with still being able to have enough freedom to kind of be uh, unique with my methods and how I approach the material. Um, at this point, I've been here for almost 12 weeks, working approximately 36 hours a week. Um, during this time, I've processed three personal collections. I've written blog posts about my work, which you can read on our website. I've created and edited finding aids um, that will be used by researchers that want to access our collections. Um, I've spent way too much time going through old copies of Drummer Magazine. Um, <laughs> I've opened a million can of worms. And I attempted to create an alien and parody of the Full House introduction credits, uh, which we're actually going to watch right now. Um, well, uh, okay, I can explain why before. Um, so every Friday, so there's three full-time staff here, Rick, Jeff, and Jacob. There's three interns, me, um, Liz, and Angelique. And on Fridays, we have three additional volunteers. So we have a very, very full house on Fridays. So we kind of figured out a fun way to kind of interact with our social media uh, community. So we started hashtagging everything Full House Fridays and taking goofy pictures and everything. Um, and I came up with a brilliant idea that we actually <laughs> take the Full House theme song and create a video to it. Um, so that's what we're going to watch now. And that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to other events all over the country. 
Um, following by, I chose to do the Michelle Buchanan collection. Um, one of the things that makes community archives so important is that they try to prioritize all members of communities, including people who are forgotten, or as By Johnson actually calls them, unsung heroes. Um, Michelle was one of those people. Um, she was very involved in the New York Leather and SM pansexual community in the 90s, um, and including writing a PhD dissertation at the new school um, on the, the scene in New York City. Um, she was one of the founding members of Black Leather and Color, which was a magazine published in the mid-90s for and by people of color. Um, much of this process has been about familiarizing myself with my and our history and knowing what needs to be prioritized. Um, it can be said that the work of an archivist is inherently political. Um, I would agree, but I think everything's political, so that's kind of beside the point. Um, <laughs> I believe in the prioritization of voices of people and groups who are less often heard. Um, in the case of the leather community, much of our image is built on a very specific kind of classical masculinity. Um, if you look around this auditorium right now, I think all but one image is of a man. Um, you'll see a woman in a cat suit over there in that wall. Um, and that's our history. Um, and we can't deny it because that would be denying our history. Um, but I think it's also important that we think critically about the role that masculinity and men specifically um, play in our history. Taking that into account, I knew that prioritizing the collection, the collections of women that would help expand the Women's Leather History Project um, was something that I really wanted to do this summer. In doing this, I spent hours digging through our vertical files, reading about groups like Lesbian Sex Mafia, San Juan, and The Outcasts. Um, I read the newsletters of those organizations and other publications such as Honor, Ta Honor Bats and Gratitat. Um, I learned about women like Bob Johnson, Jan Hall, Judy Hall and McCarthy, um, and events such as Power Search. Um, I have been fortunate enough, as uh, Rip mentioned, to be able to study with one of these women, Gail Rubin. Um, Gail was one of the founding members of San Juan, um, and you can see the vest. Do we have that? Do we have that here? No, it's just a photograph. Okay, it's just a photograph. We don't have that here. I'm sure that's that in uh, the GLBT Historical Society. She has it. She has it. Oh, yeah. mm. um, <laughs> Bougie of me to dramatically theorize about public sex. 
Um, though this may have been the point in which a more established version of gay culture emerged, maybe because of medicalization, maybe not. Um, but what I started to discover in reading about the criminalization of homosexuality in the 17th and 18th and 19th century London actually told me differently. Um, so I did a research project um, in which I investigated the cruising tactics that gay men used in London in the 17th century. Um, and I can kind of go and tell other scholars previous material, but if you're more interested in it, come see me at the talk, um, and we can talk about it more. Um, what I wanted to do with this research is address and interrogate the public sex lives, and specifically the non-verbal tactics that were used to achieve those public sex lives. Um, keeping in mind that this is pre-medicalized and solely criminalized British sodomy. Um, I saw a striking lack in analytical research looking at public sex tactics that emerge from primary sources, um, and I kind of wanted to call them exactly what they are. Um, they're the exact same tactics that we still use today. Um, and we still use them to find easily available and anonymous sexual partners. Um, my intention, though, wasn't necessarily to take those tactics and contextualize them within a specific like, historical moment or subject, like in 18th century London. Um, actually, I wanted to develop this analytical way of thinking about these tactics um, and investigate them with the broader concepts of nonverbal information flow. Um, so to do this, I utilized the digital archives of the Old Bailey Courthouse in London, where I was able to explore the anti-sodomy cases from the 18th century. Um, if you're a historian of sexuality, I really recommend checking out the digitized archives. They're free and available to everybody, and you can search through, through a variety of ways, including like narrowing it down by sodomy. Um, I also used gossip and morality pamphlets at the time, um, all of which provided me examples of cruising tactics that men used in public places. Um, from my sources, I was able to deduce uh, five very, very familiar cruising tactics. Um, one, a prolonged eye contact between two people. Um, two, the act of rushing against someone. Um, three, the squeezing of a hand in a specific way dissimilar to a handshake. They always say dissimilar to a handshake, that's how they can tell they're gay. Um, <laughs> and individual positioning themselves to urinate, though urination actually didn't have to happen for it to be gay. Um, and a general, <laughs> a general positioning of the body, um, which is perceived by others in pursuit as homosexual in nature. Um, additionally, we know because of primary sources that these were geographical, these were happening in geographical locations um, that added context to nonverbal tactics and allowed them to be interpreted as homosexual. So these people like, weren't in a specific park or a specific alley. They weren't in just like, any train station, um, much like the way they happen now. Though, I mean, the expansion, um, who knows, I cruise pretty heavily in uh, grocery stores over the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this research was partially inspired by a quote from Edward Stevenson's The Intersexes, written under the pseudonym Xavier Maine and published in 1908. Um, I'd like to read this quote to y'all. Um, before I read it, he uses the word uranium. And Uranium was the was uh, what they called homosexual men who identified with homosexual culture in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, not people that just practice homosexual acts. Um, it is the mysterious site of the Uranian fraternity, that psychic sexual interrogation, that signal and challenge everywhere current and understood among homosexuals. It is true that homosexuality of a Uranian is not meant in his glance unless he needs it to be so met. Many homosexuals sedulously avoid it. Part of this protected mask is the watch against such eloquence of a mere exchange of looks. True, also, is it that the look, in part, is explained by the fact that the Uranian eye, especially in the higher type, is almost always singularly luminous, and that its penetrating gaze can be disturbingly direct. But the homosexual glance is not mere fiction. And I bet a few of you out there know um, some of these singular luminous homosexuals. <laughs> So to kind of like teach y'all about this, 
I actually want to take two volunteers from the crowd. Um, you don't have to know. There's one. And, I, and it's going to involve cruising. So, and Sean, come on. <laughs>
37, called For Your Convenience, a learned dialogue instructive to all Londoners and London visitors. Uh, this guide was actually written as a veiled homosexual city guide. It included a map of all the best public toilets for cruising in London in 1937. Um, so what these like these tourists didn't realize is that they're actually only going to toilets that are used for public sex. Um, but <laughs> I used Google Maps to compare the previously mentioned geographic data. Um, doing this, I actually ran into other cruising maps that other people had created using customizable Google Maps. Um, this, for example, uh, is, uh, is, a, a, is, for, is Madrid. Um, and what you see here, like the green trees are parks where the cruising is good, these are shopping centers where the cruising is good, train stations where the cruising is good, parking lots, I guess, fucking <laughs> airports. <laughs> Something that was probably really naive of me. Oh, well, naively, it, it continues for a minute. Something that's probably impossible to figure out for sure. It turned into an opportunity to explore and contextualize the evolution of technology as it pertains to finding sexual partners in public. Um, so, this kind of leads into my next section of my talk called, that I titled 21st Century Communication Practices and the Possibilities for New and Different Kinds of Engagement. Um, so, we all know that the internet has changed the way we find sexual partners. Um, it's changed the ways in which we communicate, it changes the ways in which we find each other, uh, the ways we discover gayness in the first place, how we access community, the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, the future of my research is less historical in nature, and it's really meant to be couched in contemporary uses of technology. Um, but now, I am glad that I did all that historical research because I never have to write a literature review ever again. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I'm glad that I did that historical research because I said before, every event and every moment of queerness and deviance so desire and revel in um, is a product of these processes that have been happening and will continue to happen. Um, so in turn, every technology and way I wish to communicate with others, other potential sexual partners, is a product of these historical processes. Um, so my master's thesis, uh, which I will be starting once I return in our next one, we'll look at two different things. So the first being how are these users of these hookup apps uh, utilizing the interfa inter interface of the apps themselves to navigate physical safety concerns? Uh, so like queer bashings, et cetera. And then also what are the different uses between urban and rural users and are there additional concerns, especially for rural users, that aren't being addressed by the developers? Um, so I don't know if y'all keep up with the news or anything about cruising apps, but there's been kind of a lot of murders happening lately uh, off of Grindr. I know in Ann Arbor, actually in my neighborhood, somebody was murdered in December uh, off of a Grindr hookup. Uh, two men were murdered in Seattle recently, and somebody was also murdered in Philadelphia in the past four months. Um, so what I see is there's not a lot of conversations happening around physical safety. I mean, we always have these conversations on health and safety, but we're not really having conversations about like, Oh, like what do you do to prevent yourself from being murdered? And like these aren't happening in like podunk towns in the country that we always associate with like queer bashings. These are happening in fucking Ann Arbor, all lesbians, Seattle, all lesbians and bears, in Philadelphia, I mean, I'm sure there are queer people there somewhere, but it's still just like, um, So I'm really interested in kind of investigating how people are navigating these. Uh, there's also like a huge, I mean, I didn't realize this until I actually got to graduate school, but there's a huge lack of information being researched about rural users of technology. Um, and finally, these researchers will be like, oh shit, we forgot about poor rural people. Like, <laughs> so I'm really interested, as somebody who kind of grew up in like a suburban rural area, uh, how we can better utilize those users in developing technology, especially technology that speaks to their desires and their needs. Um, so I believe that different kinds of communication and engagement are possible. Um, and I don't believe that the internet is ruining public sex or that it's killing the leather bar. Um, I believe that there are now multiple points of entry for our future community members, um, whether that be a recon or the leather bar. Um, I got involved in the um, leather community via recon. Um, I also believe that there are now multiple modes of accessing public sex culture, whether it be on Grindr, the back room of a certain bar down the street, or a truck stop app. Um, part of my internship at the Weather Archives and Museum has been doing a lot of brainstorming and strategizing around what community engagement actually looks like on social media, a new frontier for community archives and archives more broadly. Um, so I'm going to go into this next section called Community Archives in the 21st Century. Um, more often than not, uh, this is what community engagement looks like in 2014. 
Uh, we post content to our social media feed, and you either passively enjoy, um, if the information actually makes it to you, um, or you actively respond. Um, if you're not seeing our posts on Facebook, you could be seen on Tumblr, Instagram, or Twitter. Um, and if you're the old-fashioned type, um, you might actually engage with us directly at events like I am Alec Hawk. If you live in Chicago, you have the opportunity to engage with us here and in the Leather Archives and Museum and come to events like this. Um, so what do I mean by community archives? So broadly, community archives are collections of materials gathered primarily by members of a given community and over whose use community members exercise some level of control. The way that the Leather Archives and Museum operates the community archives is through a few different ways. Um, so first, we're a not-for-profit institution whose funding comes almost solely from whether folks becoming dues paying members of the LNM and organizations and events uh, named as some beneficiaries. Um, our staff are all members of this broadly defined community, um, and most of our volunteers are as well. And if they aren't when they enter the door to volunteer, they are when they leave. <laughs> uh, our collections uh, come ex almost come exclusively as donations from community members and organizations. Um, and additionally, our governing board of directors is made up from other folks from all over the USA. Um, so what does community archiving for LAN look like in the 21st century? Um, besides just expanding our engagement in social media and making sure that we get, um, stay involved in local <coughs> national events. I believe that one of the most innovative and community-driven ways to change archives in the 21st century is to not only expand how we engage with our community, but to make that engagement a two-way street, um, inviting our community members to actively participate in the art world process. Um, there's been a surge in the past five years of art world scholarship that wants to investigate what it looks like to radically change the ways in which we, in which community and other archives include their users and community members into the art world process itself. Um, though ethnic and cultural museums have been doing this for a long time, actively involving community members, this is mostly been in the place of like advisory roles or having a board, a community member board that govern, governs the institution. Um, both of those things like we already do. Um, so part of my internship has been looking at the ways we can take this engagement that exists on our social media and turn that into a sort of roundtable discussion. Um, how can we actually incorporate the information from our social media accounts um, into our records, both digital and physical, and what does that actually look like? Um, unfortunately for me, nobody's written a manual on it. Um, um, and I think that's because nobody's doing it. It's really cool. It creates a really awesome opportunity for us as an archive to do really innovative and kind of groundbreaking um, work in the study of archives. Um, so I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by the staff and volunteers at the LAM who are also really interested in how this process could look um, and what it could do for our collection. Through conversations, we've been able to identify um, two areas in which we incorporate information from our community members and our collections. Um, the first way to do this is through volunteer information, um, from our social media accounts specifically. Um, when I say volunteer information, I mean unsolicited information. Um, this looks most familiar with like, maybe comments on a Facebook thread. Um, so, for example, we have two Facebook pages. We have our Leather Archives Museum page, and we have a Women's Leather History page. Um, a couple weeks ago, we posted a poster um, on the Women's Weather History Project page of an event called Power Surge, which was a weather deck event in Seattle in the early and mid 90s. Um, one of the, after people are talking and sharing, somebody comments that who turned out to be the artist um, who created the poster with their girlfriend um, and was really interested in donating a t shirt that they still have left over from the event. Um, first of all, we had no fucking clue who the artist was, boom. And second, we didn't have that t shirt, boom. Um, so there you go, we're already expanding our collection just by engaging with community and social media. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we can do this. One, we're expanding our collections. Two, we're finding out more information about the collective of the stuff we already have in our collections. And like, who knows what could come of this. We could keep in contact with this person. We could end up getting maybe a donation of early 90s weather dyke art. Like, that would be fucking amazing. And I'm not, I don't think that we actually have like a very large collection of early 90s weather dyke art, as far as I know. Um, the second way to do this is through a process that a lot of you are probably familiar with, uh, crowdsourcing. Um, in this way, we've actually put out a call for specific information on a topic. Um, for example, Liz, one of our interns recently, um, put out a call for information on an organization called the Chicago Sluts. Um, they were a weather like organization in the 90s, bought, ran by and for women, um, and we just don't have a lot of information on them. 
Um, so this put out this, this call for information, and you might have seen the blue black chair in front. Um, that's from Daddy William. And it turns out that Daddy William was actually the resident boot black for all of their events. So in turn, we got information about the Chicago Sluts. Um, we actually got a photo of Daddy William with some of the members of the Chicago Sluts. And all of a sudden, the context for the Chicago Sluts documents that we have expands and expands. Um, so I'm really excited about the ways that we can incorporate new ways of community engagement um, into expanding our collections. Um, though we are still working on the actual oper oper operationalization and implementation of these projects, it feels really incredible to be involved in work that feels so important and necessary in a community that I love and appreciate so much. Um, so that comes towards the end. Um, so in closing, <laughs> I would love to thank the Weather Archives and Museum, um, and this penis head right here, um, <laughs> for this incredible opportunity to work here for three months. Um, I'd especially like to thank Big Jeff and Liz for putting up with my four to five days a week that I'm here. Um, I'd like to thank the University of Michigan School of Information who gave me a $3,000 um, grant to do the work that I've been able to do this summer. Um, and I'd especially like to thank my supervisor, Jacob, um, who has been one of the best friends I've ever had, um, has been here through thick and thin for the past 12 weeks. Uh, he's taught me things every fucking day. I feel like I've been able to also teach him. Um, for being someone that I can go to uh, if I have a problem or if I just can talk about shit. Um, and for hating and loving everything right on the side. <laughs> Um, so the near future holds a lot of exciting things for me, um, including maybe this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I start my thesis research next month. Um, the first week of September marks the second half of my master's program. Um, I start applying for PhD programs in the fall. Um, I look forward to continuing to work with the LIMM to expand the social media for our archiving project. Um, I've got a lot of ideas packed in my head, and they're all the first thing to come out. Um, so I have a lot of things that I'd like to continue working on in the future when I'm not like writing more fucking articles and applying PhD programs and shooting. Um, but if you take anything away from this presentation, I think it's most important to realize that the ways in which we communicate our desires and build community is constantly changing. Um, but it's also constantly staying the same. Um, and that it's important that we stay intentional and that we stay subversive in the techniques and tactics that we use to get hard and stay hard. Um, so with that, I would like to end my presentation and I would like to open the